Welcome to part one of the data visualization in Python tutorial series. Data visualization is obviously a very popular subject and there are tons of resources on it. But honestly, with new tools that keep springing up, new web technologies and all the cool new libraries that didn't even exist six months ago, I wanted to be the series that I could use to train our own team of data scientists. And since I'm going to be putting in the work, I thought I might as well share it with you, uh, my dear viewers on YouTube. So what separates it from other tutorials on the same topic of data visualization? Well, for a start, I think the objective and the intent here matters a lot. I run Algorithma, a data science education center based in Singapore and Jakarta, Indonesia. And I also run Supertype, which operates fully remotely as a full cycle data science consultancy slash development house. Uh, and in these two companies, we often need to build things for clients. And sometimes these things are visualization products. For example, they go on dashboards, they go on web applications. They don't just sit in a Jupyter notebook or Google Collab notebook. So speaking of intent, a lot of what I put out on this channel, I have that specific use case in mind. It's about building things out there that uh, customers can interact with, not some piece of code that just sits on your laptop with no audience for it. So in this series, while the primary focus is on data visualization, the secondary focus is on building stuff that is out there that recruiters can look at, that um, you know your client can pay money for, that your manager and subordinates can check out, whether in the form of a web application, a mobile application, or API service. So we will start from learning about the grammar of graphic systems through this fantastic library called Altair, and we'll learn how to create animated graphics if you ever see those moving bar charts or animating um, graphics maybe on social media, uh, yeah, we create those, right? Web-based interactive visualization. So not just a static PNG, but an interactive plots that react to click events, zoom in, zoom out, show a tooltip when there's a mouse over, allowing you to hold down your mouse to select a region or a plot, um, etc. So we learn a whole lot of other related technologies beyond Altair as well. You pick up some HTML, you pick up some JavaScript, some Vega Lite when it's necessary, but I will go, I'll go over those concepts when it's time. The whole point is to do it very gradually and the only prerequisite is some basic familiarity with Python and an environment to run your code in. I recommend Visual Studio Code because it's free, it's open source and it runs on every OS including Linux which is what I'm using but Code Editor is totally a matter of preference so I'll leave that to you. Uh, but speaking of Altair, I've used Altair to build production level apps and tools since 2018 so I've got a solid 4-5 years of experience with it and if you've been on this channel for a while you know that a lot of my build an app or build a dashboard tutorial videos feature the use of Altair even up to something as recently as my last 4-5 to five videos I still use Altair. So I've gotten um, also a lot of comments that ask to see a more drawn out lesson on Altair and so I've decided to just create a proper series to just give it, uh, do, do it justice. Now in terms of the core structure, it will feature the data visualization curriculum by the University of Washington. This curriculum is licensed under the BSD3 clause and is taught in the University of Washington's CSE512 clause. So let's start by talking about your tools and setup. Once you have Visual Studio Code installed, go ahead and make sure you have the Python extension installed as well. So go into extension, search for Python without the caps. So this will do. And then there is this by Microsoft, it says IntelliSense PyLens. That's the one you want to be installing. All right, so go ahead, install that. And make sure that, that once that is installed, you want to make sure that you activate an environment in which you have installed the Jupyter package as well. And you do that by pulling up the terminal. You can also use the built-in terminal in here. I'm going to clear the screen. And you could just activate the environment if you already have this Jupyter installed. Uh, if you don't know what I'm doing here, if you have no idea what I'm talking about here, it's likely that you haven't had Jupyter installed. So what you need to do is to just install Jupyter into an environment and you do that typically through pip install and then you say Jupyter or you say conda install Jupyter. So depending on whether you use conda or not, right? Um, and then if you say conda install Jupyter, it's going to go ahead and install that into the environment. So you want to activate the environment, install the Jupyter package or you just use pip and pip install um, Jupyter pack, the, the Jupyter package. And then once you're in there, go ahead and activate that. While you're also in this environment, you might also as well just go ahead and install Altair and Pandas as well. So you also do the same thing. You say pip, pip installs Pandas and you say pip installs Altair. So I want to go ahead and just install all the three libraries, right? The, uh, the, the Jupyter, the Altair and the Pandas. These are the main three packages that we'll be using throughout the series. And once you've done that, you could just go ahead and create a new folder and then start working from there. So within Visual Studio Code itself, you could go ahead and create, a, open up a folder. I already have this called LearnVis on my uh, desktop. And you want to go ahead and just also call up the command palette and then say select interpreter. So command to open up the command palette, you say command shift P. So command shift P, that opens up the command palette. And here you type in the command, right? And in this case, you want to say select interpreter. If you have multiple environments, it's going to ask you to pick one from those things that you detect, right? Um, it detected that I have Analyst, App Review, CV, Live OS, Web3, YouTube, all kinds of things. And the one I want to be activating is Analyst because that's where I installed Jupyter and that's where I installed my Pandas and that's also where I installed my Altair. So I'm going to activate that. And to those daredevils that is trying to get everything installed on the root environment, uh, it's probably fine when you're in learning mode, but I recommend you learn how to work with virtual environments. It's a great investment as a Python professional. And then now, once you have that activated and you have Jupyter installed in that environment that you activated, then you could just go ahead and create a new Jupyter notebook by using the command palette again, command shift P, 
and then you could just say Jupyter and you say create new Jupyter notebook. So there is the create new Jupyter notebook. There is a kind of th th there's all kind of commands in here. There's like convert the notebook to a Python script, uh, create interactive video, filter kernels. Don't have to worry about any of that. Just hit on the create new Jupyter notebook. That's method number one. The other the other way to do that is to just create a new file and name the file. Uh, when you name the file, just end it with the extension of IPYNB, which stands for I uh, Py Notebook, Python Notebook. Okay, so interactive Python Notebook. So you can just any name. But if you say .ipynb, then your Python extension is going to recognize that and it's going to, let me just do that, and it's going to just open that up in this kind of, a, uh, you know, this kind of a UI. This is basically the, the notebook UI in Visual Studio Code itself. If you don't want to learn, if you don't care about Visual Studio Code and you just want to do everything in Google Colab or you want to do everything in Jupyter Notebook, that's also all good and fine. Uh, I'm doing this in Visual Studio Code because there are, later on, I want to take all of this. Uh, I may think about maybe uh, publishing them, um, you, you create, creating, uh, creating things on top of that, let's say a web app on top of that. And so using Visual Studio Code, it's just easy to make the transition later without having to copy or, or like download that as a script and then uh, open up an IDE. So that's kind of my preferred way of working with uh, a notebook. Um, you can use whatever that works for you. Uh, right after here, on the right hand side, you see that there's this thing called the analyst. This is my virtual environment. You can click on that and you can select uh, a kernel, right? So this is a kernel, this is a, a kernel selector. You can just pick one from there. You could also just, uh, and also by the way, once you click on the right kernel, um, you select your kernel, you should see that the, the language detection is going to work and the cell language mode, you can click on that. It's going to give you um, a ton of, it's going to say auto detect first. So if I write some code in here, it's going to detect that as Python. That's going to be the auto detect, but you could also change that to any of this, right? So if I write some SQL statements and now it's going to tell me that this is not valid Python. And if I change this to SQL, now, all of a sudden that, that goes away and now it's recognizing something as correct, right? If I change that back to Python, you see that now it says that this select is not defined. So Python, this is not the right syntax in Python, but if you change that to SQL, then um, it recognizes that, okay? So that those are those are some of the, the basics of working in a with a Jupyter Notebook for, file format in Visual Studio Code itself. Or uh, once you've written some code, you could go ahead and just click on this green button to run the code. Right, so we're gonna we're gonna see that and we're gonna do it like slowly. But what you typically see me do as we progress is that I'm not gonna use the mouse a lot. I'm gonna use the, my keyboard shortcuts. So when you see me run a code without moving my mouse, the way I do that is to use the uh, shortcut, which is Control Enter or Shift Enter. Control Enter run the current cell. Shift Enter run the current cell and then at once to the next cell. So I could say something like import pandas as PD. And if I hit on shift enter, it's going to run this cell and then it's going to bring open up a new cell and bring me to the next cell. All right. That's the difference between control enter and shift enter. Later on, you also see that there's the run all, run all above or run all below. Those are things that you'll see later as well. You can also export this notebook as a Python file, a PDF or a HTML file using the, again, the command palette. So command shift P, you could say, take this and you can say export Jupyter export to HTML, Jupyter export to PDF or Jupyter export to Python script. So those are also options in there. So I'm assuming those are just some warm ups just to if you're very new to working with a Jupyter file within Visual Studio Code, this is kind of the introduction to that. Now we're actually going to start creating, uh, composing our first uh, Altair pod. So to give you more space, I'm going to hide my view here and I'm going to come back at the end of the video. So I'm going to hide my view here and just to uh, free up some, ex uh, some, some real estate here. Okay, so the first idea that matters here is that data in Altair is usually built around the pandas data frame, which consists of a set of name columns. When you use Altera, data sets are commonly provided as data frames. So because of that, we, we might as well just import that in here. I want to also import Altera set, um, because that's the main library that we're going to be working with. So those are the two things that you want to bring in. And depending on your environment, if you're working in this, uh, working with, with, let's say in Google Colab, you, you don't, do not have to do this. So if you're using Google Colab or Jupyter Lab or Jupyter Notebook, then you should not have to do anything. But because we're using Visual Studio Code, we want to actually specify a renderer. So a renderer basically tells renderers and renderer basically tells the app what to do when it comes to displaying or rendering the chart itself. So Visual Studio Code Python is, itself, it includes a Vega Lite renderer to display charts in app within this. So you can see a chart directly in the notebook um, through this Vega Lite MIME type, M-I-M-E. I'm not sure if it's a MIME. I don't know how you pronounce that, but you'll put MIME type like this. And so that's going to tell Visual Studio Code Python, the, the Python extension that you install to do, um, you know, to use the Vega Lite renderer that comes with it to, to render the plots, right? And then now you want to specify a data and then we could go ahead and try and create a simple plot just to see how everything looks, looks like, right? So we're going to say df equals to panda read CSV. Now you could read CSV, you could pass in a file here, create a new folder and then put some files in here. 
but I'm gonna just go ahead and read from a remote source and the one I'm gonna be reading is the one um, from this Miban uh, repository. So this is another project. It's also on, on my YouTube. You could go and find that video. I think it's about one hour long, uh, about one and a half hours long. So basically it's a tutorial on using Altera and uh, PyScript to generate this one page application. This, all of these charts that you see, this is Altera as well. So we are actually gonna go ahead and create something um, you know, that allows you to create all of this stuff. So all of these are in uh, Altera. And it, I think it's also in this video where uh, I get a few comments, uh, I get a few emails saying that, hey, I wanna see a more um, complete a tutorial on Altera alone. And that is kind of uh, what prompted this as well. But we're gonna be using the data for this uh, project, right? So we don't have to find the new data. So that is under data. So click on that and then under run 1km. And what you need to do is to just click on the raw data. So open a new tab and copy that. Just copy, control C, copy all of that. And then you can close out the others. This here, we can actually turn off the sidebar and we just specify, just put in the link there. Um, just to save us ourselves some time, we are gonna need the data to be parsed correctly. So we wanna make sure that the start time, this start time uh, here is actually gonna be parsed as date. So we might as well just specify that right up here. So spot parse dates and which are the columns that are dates that we should be parsed as dates. So the, the, the one here is start time. So we wanna pass start time into this as well. So I'm gonna say start time, right? And I think that's kind of it. That's kind of where the data is. We're gonna actually need to create one new column called the day of week because I wanna also check, I wanna trend, I wanna see like, you know, whether, whether there's trends or not when it comes to like uh, my running speed uh, break, broken down into day of weeks, all right? So I'm gonna go ahead and just create a new column. I'm gonna say day of week, day of week, and that would just be the start time. And you can use the date time assessor and then you could say day name. Right, so that's the fastest way to just go about that. So how do you use Altair now? And all of these are just basic panda stuff, really. But how do you use uh, Altair now? Now the fundamental object in Altair is the chart object. So you would say something like odd dot chart. Okay, this is the most fundamental object. It's the chart object. This chart object takes one argument. It takes a single argument, and the single argument would be the source of the data. So here we name our data frame DF. So I want to go ahead and just put DF in here. Right, and. This data frame, that's the single argument. We define a chart object, we pass into the data, the simple data frame that we have from here, that we read from here. But we have not told the chart to do anything with the data. We just say create a chart, all right? So if you run it right now, there's nothing that's gonna happen. Just you, you, You're you just gonna see like a, a mark is a required property. It can't even do anything because there's nothing, we, we didn't give it any information. So with a chart object in hand, what we wanna do is to basically create a graphical mark, okay? We want the data to be visualized using graphical marks. And that's why it says mark is a required property. So how do we create a graphical mark? And what is a graphical mark, by the way? In the ggplot, um, in, in the ggplot language, that is basically a geometric shape, right? So in ggplot, if you learn about uh, that, you know, in the past, you see something like geom, and then you have like geom point, or you have like geom line, that those are geometric shapes right? And the ggplot, which stands for grammar of graphics, they define those things as geometric shapes. And in here, we, we, we call them uh, graphical marks. So we want to use those to represent the data. For example, we could go ahead and add a, uh, if you want to create a point, you could go ahead and just say dot mark point, right? And now it won't complain anymore because you now actually have something. And there is a point right there. It, it's pretty nonsense, pretty useless, but it doesn't complain and it does that. But th this is kind of the bare minimum of creating the first Altair chart, all right? Now, what you need to do here is that when you look at this chart, it still lacks a few things. For example, there is no X dimension, there is no Y dimension, right? You, so to, to specify the X dimension and Y dimension, we use the encode. So we do it like this, encode. And what encode does is that it provides you a way to specify a key value mapping between the encoding channels. And what are encoding channels? Those are things like what? Like, for example, they are things like your X, your Y, your colors. These are very common. So you want to specify like, you know, certain colors, colors map to this, X map to this, Y map to this. In the ggplot language, in the grammar of graphics language, this is the aesthetic mapping itself. So this is the same here. We're trying to do some sort of aesthetic mapping. We're saying X should map to the X should map to certain um, channel and the Y should map to a certain channel, right? And then the same thing for colors, so on and so forth. There's also sometimes you see size and, and stuff. There's all of these different ways to, to map, to do some sort of aesthetic mapping, mapping the size towards a certain variable, all right? 
For Pandas data frame, fortunately enough for us, Altair is going to automatically pick an appropriate data type for the map column, which in this case, um, you know, say we want to pick, let's let's specify X and Y first, and I mean, this, this whole thing makes a lot of sense. Let's say X equals to, um, we know we have the seconds per km, so let's copy that. And let's also turn off our browser, we don't need the browser, all right? So let's say this is seconds per km, right? This is quantitative, these are not a uh, quantitative field. So Altair is going to figure that out just by looking at the date types itself, right? But if you want to look at, uh, if you just type D types, you're going to see like all of this variable have some sort of uh, the, the pandas itself is going to recognize them like, okay, this integer, this float, this is an object, meaning like a string. And so that is going to be useful for Altair to sort of infer from that and say, okay, well, seconds per time, that's a, that's a quantitative. And so you no longer have to um, you know, specify one unless um, it, it, it's ambiguous. Then in that case, you want to specify saying that this is actually quantitative. Okay, so for now, let's let's just leave it off and see what happens there. All right, and let's run that. And so now we have the points, we have the X dimension now. So seconds per cam, we actually have one now coming out like that, right? And even though we've separated the data by one attribute, we still have actually multiple points that are crowding into this range between 220 to 310, I guess, and it's crowding over these points. So they're still overlapping. Um, with each other and it's hard to actually make sense of this. So how do we add another dimension? And by adding another dimension, let's say the Y dimension, we could maybe better visualize this data, right? So we do that by putting a Y to encode the Y channel. And the way we encode the Y channel is the same as what we did earlier, but now you could specify something. For example, you could specify the day of week that you just created up here, right? So let's go ahead and do that. Let's say day of week. Let's run that. So now you have the X and you have the Y. Now on the X axis, you see that this is zero to 400 and then on the Y axis, that's the day of week, which is what we have here. And now you have two dimensions. And of course you wanna, you can also change that and you can say map the color to let's say day of week as well. Um, you could, uh, we, we see a lot of uh, you know different combinations, but let's just try one. And you can see now they have colors and you have the colors on a, uh, as a legend. You could turn off the legend, you could rename that, you could rename all of this. And we, we see a lot of this, but this is kind of the sort of the introductory, uh, introductory uh, idea into Altair, this is kind of the gateway into Altair, right? And like I said earlier, all of this, the data type of it, you could specify that. You could say day of week, this is actually going to be um, nominal, for example, right? This is going to be nominal, this is going to be quantitative, you could do this, you can specify, and if you run, you see no, no difference, it's still going to be there. But even if you omit them, um, they are still going to be inferred anyway. So quantitative lines, if you see that they're quantitative, let's say, for example, this is quantitative, seconds per km is quantitative, you see what Altair would do is that it will uh, create the, the use some sensible default for example it's going to create the grid lines you see the grid lines between every 50 increment of 50 50 100 150 200 250 300 all right the appropriate grid lines and axis titles are all being added to your plot by Altair uh, one other thing with Altair is that these are all very declarative so all you need to do is to just declare them and say x equals to this y equals to this you don't have to yeah, if you have any experience using matplotlib you know that the, that that's not a different that, that's a very different kind of uh, uh, development uh, experience right here these things are very declarative you don't have to specify how you get that you just specify what you want right so x i want it to be seconds per cam you don't specify the how uh, compare that to matplotlib where you have to actually be pretty ex uh, pretty pr uh, explicit in telling it how to get there and not what you want to get all right um for example another example is that you could very quickly just chain interactive onto this in Altair and you can make this plot an interactive plot. So what interactive allows you to do is you can zoom in and you can pan out. You can zoom in by using a mouse like this. You can also sort of scroll around um, like this on an X and a Y and you can see that, right? It's pretty cool. So you can zoom in, you can zoom out, you could drag around and you can do a lot more. You can later add tooltip to it and, and hover on hover effect and stuff. And we'll see a lot of those. That's kind of the point of, um, you know, this, this whole course is to demonstrate all these different things you can do, but we do it very gradually. Now, another thing I want to maybe uh, talk about is uh, as well is that we specify the key values up here, the X, the Y, the color, the shape, the size, all of this using keyword arguments here, right? We said X equals to this, Y equals to this. Um, actually, additionally to, to this kind of syntax, there's also another way to sort of do this encoding definition. And that is kind of using, the, that is to be, instead of this, let me actually comment this out, right? We don't need the colors anymore. But instead of doing this, what you can do as well, you can say alt.x. Right, so this is kind of the this is the kind of the X schema wrapper within Altair itself. So you could use this, and you can to, to get the same effect. We could just do the same thing seconds per km, and then the Y we could say odd dot Y, odd basically this comes from the export from here, the import Altair as alt, so alt dot Y, 
And what do we want here? We want to have the day of week. And if you run, everything should still work, right? So X and Y still works. So th there are two ways to do it. The first one is to just use the keyword argument, say X equals to this, Y equals to this. The other one is to use the construction, uh, the construction method, because this allows you to specify a lot more values within it. You can, um, these are all just arguments into this function. So you can provide more parameters to this encoding, this, this X encoding, you can par uh, provide more parameters to this Y encoding, uh, as we'll see later in this series. For now, um, this is kind of uh, just to, to to, to get you started, you just need to worry about, um, you know, x equals to y equals to, and that's another way. So you see this used interchangeably over the course of the series as well. Um, some of you may ask, well, what if we use them, uh, interleave them with different methods? What, what if I use the constructor method up here, but on y, I use something like y equals to, and I say something like day of week, would it work, right? So let's say this, would it work? Because here I use the construction method, here I use alternate uh, y equals to, uh, the, the shorthand. So then let's run that and see what happens and you will realize that it still works, all right? So the two styles of specifying encoding can be interleaved. You could say that, okay, why are, it's just gonna be very simple, but X, I want it to be this because I wanna specify a few more parameters. For example, I wanna say what, what kind of aggregation I wanna use. So aggregate would be like mean, median and stuff. We're gonna talk about those things later, but you could use them like that and it will still work. And I think by now, I should also make it quite clear that you could do another thing. Let me show you. If I have X and I have Y, and I want to flip the axis. I want to actually have my Monday, Friday, Tuesday, Wednesday, all of that to be on the X axis, but I want all of the seconds per cam to be on the Y axis. Then all I need to do is to just swap them. So basically move this up and Y become X, X become Y. And if I run that, of course, I don't want to miss out a comma, run that. Then you should see that it still works. Okay, except now you see that the day of week is going to be at the bottom, seconds of PKM is going to be at the top. So you could still drag, zoom in, zoom out, um, drag, move around. We should, of course, uh, turn off the terminal at the bottom to have more sort of more screen space to work with. So anyway, when you see a Q, that's actually a quantitative type, a quantitative, basically we just put quantitative for Q, um, and would be, be the nominal type. These are very common. You will also see something like the uh, O, which is the O for ordinal types. I put capital O for ordinal types. You will also see time temporal type, okay? So these are usually, temporal types are usually dates, um, time. Um, the difference between, let's just give a crash course here as well. The Look at the Q itself, that's quantitative. Quantitative are just basically numerical data, right? These are all numerical data with certain meaningful magnitudes to it. And then N is basically nominal type. Nominal this, uh, would, would just be uh, unordered. You know, it could be categorical. So basically any kind of categorical, right? Any kind of, like, if you come from the R world, you think about this like factor, uh, factors, all right? And then O, these are also basically um, categorical data usually, but then they are actually rank ordered. They actually have a, for example, low, high, medium. For example, uh, uh, you know, the risk level. Risk level, you uh, they have high level, high level of risk, medium level of risk, low, uh, low, um, level of risk. And so even though they're categorical, they're actually rank ordered. So there, there's some sort of rank to it. Um, let's say, you know, how fast is the car? Fast, medium, slow, extremely slow, or, or static, right? So there are the different levels. Um, there, there, there's a certain ranking to it, even though they're categorical, but there's a rank to it. So that's kind of the main difference, quantitative, nominal, uh, ordinal, and temporal. Um, actually, I want to switch this back from Y to X because they, I think it looks better the other way, not this way. I'm going to put a comma here, take out where this comma. And now let's take a look, take a look at this, right? So there's also another very important discussion when we talk about visualization, and that is about tidy data frames, right? So you can't really go any further in this, this discussion without talking about tidy data frames. So what are tidy data frames? I'm gonna open up the browser, go into a link, and I'm probably gonna walk you through it. Uh, I'll put the link to this uh, article and you can go read, read them up on your own. But this, uh, this is this is an interesting um, sort of discussion on its own. Tidy data sets are all alike, but every mess messy data set is messy in its own way. Kind of a, a play on uh, Leo Tolstoy's um, original quote. But let's take a look at uh, what are the three definitions here. So there are the three inter interrelated rules which makes a data set tidy. This is kind of the key of that, all right? Each variable must have its own column, each observation must have its own row, and each value must have its own cell. So what it means here is that if you look at the data frame on its own, right, each row itself, each row here, that must be one singular observation. So Afghanistan in year 1940, with this amount of cases, this amount of population, that's one observation. 
variable, each variable must, must have its own column. So for example, you don't want to have something like that says here variable and then here you have year, cases, population. Now that's not going to be a tidy diagram anymore. That doesn't meet, that doesn't set, specify, uh, that doesn't um, satisfy the rules here. All right. So each value in here, this must all have its own cell, meaning you don't want to actually, you know some data sets that, that is like the, the wide to long data set where you see like year is moved down. So year and then here is 1990 and then 1990 and then, uh, uh, and then 2000 and then here uh, cases is moved down as well and then you have variable. Uh, if this doesn't make sense, let me show you, uh, let me just pivot this data real quick and then maybe show you what I mean by that, all right? For example, I could take the data frame right now. Let's take a look at the head of data. So this is kind of a tidy data frame where everything, each of this is one observation. This is one observation. This is second observation, third observation. Each of the variables are in its own column. That's good. And then finally, each of the value will take up one exact cell. All right, that's cool. But what if I take this data and I pivot them? Let's say I pivot them. And I say, take the uh, I want the columns to be, let me pick one. Uh, I'm going to pick day of week since we talking about that anyway, right? Day of week. And I want to specify the values to that as well. I'm going to, in this case, I'm going to specify the values to be, um, I don't know, let's say seconds per cam. Okay. And let me run that. Now you see that this data, this is still a proper data frame. It's still not wrong as a data frame. It's still a correct data frame, but it, it will no longer satisfy that condition earlier because now each of the column, um, the day of week column, they, they don't actually fall into its own, um, it, it doesn't get into its own uh, row any, uh, anymore. Instead, what happened is the day of week is actually spread out. So day of week initially was just one column, right? Now it's spread out to be its own, each of the level would have its own column. And so now this is a white data frame. This is uh, in, in the data analysis world, when you clean data, you have the white data versus the long data. And in this case here, what we did was we take the data and we make it white, right? And so now Friday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. So this is not, this doesn't satisfy, this no longer satisfy the three uh, requirements to be called a tidy data frame. All right. So let's close this one out. If you want to read more about the subject, go ahead. Um, you can you know read them on its own. But here it says that you want to put each variable in a column. You don't want to do um, what you see up there. Um, all right. So I'm going to close that out. This is done now. Let's close that. Now, going back to Altair. To allow for more flexibility in how data are visualized, we, there are also a few other things you can do. Let me actually copy, um, actually, let's, let's just copy this part of the code here. We are going to open up a new cell. We don't need any of this anymore. So let's take away the interactive as well. So to allow for more flexibility in how data are visualized, um, Altair also come in with some built-in syntax for aggregation of data. So for example, we can compute the average of all values by specifying an aggregation fun function. So instead of actually looking at a raw value, seconds per km of each run, we could say something like, what is the, um, what is the average seconds per km over each week? We could do that. And the way you do that is you specify, for example, average. Now, where did average come from? That's part of the aggregation function. That's part of the uh, transformation function that Altair provides you with. So I could say aggregate, uh, I could say aggregate with the mean, uh, the, ma the, the, the count, the sum, the minimum, the maximum, the average, the median, or the standard deviation. These are some of the examples that you could use. So I could use the average here. In later lessons of this series, we're going to take a look at each one of those data transformation and we're going to actually uh, chain them and then use even more complex calculation formula. For now, let's keep it simple. Let's maybe have this and let's run that. Now, what happened is that now, instead of looking at each observation, we're only going to look at the aggregate. And the aggregate, if we use average, it will be average. If we change this to minimum, so we say mean, that's going to give you the mean, all right? If you change that to max, it's going to give you the maximum, all right? So again, we're going to see, uh, take a closer look at that. This is kind of an introductory materials. We don't need to um, try each one of those things. But let me put a comment here real quick. And I, I would say like you could try with uh, count, sum, mean, max, average, median, and standard deviation. STDV. All right. And of course, there are more powerful calculation formula you can specify. And those are maybe in, in future videos. And you also notice up to this point that just kind of like ggplot and those kind of high, li li uh, high level libraries, you don't actually specify any colorings and stuff, but it picks some sensible defaults for you. For example, it gives a sensible default for the x axis, the y axis name, and the color even. This is a blue color, but you didn't specify anywhere in here that you, you, want, a color, you want a color of blue. So, how do you change that? Right, how you customize your visualization to give it your own color instead of taking the default values in here. So by default, um, all of these choices are provided to you, but you can specify that. So we're going to see some examples of that. Let's go ahead and actually see, uh, paste our code in here as well. Let's copy this and write a new one here. Um, let's actually start with customizing a few things. Let's customize the color of these points here. 
So in the color, when it comes to color, you can change this color to use any kind of valid CSS color string. So any kind of CSS color string means you can either use a hex representation. So for example, you could say something like color and you can specify, let's say uh, a hex code. So A9, 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 that's one, that's a valid one, right? And now you have a different color, right? If you try something like um, E, 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 you get a very light color. But if you say B, 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 you get a darker color. Okay, not too many, not too many B. Okay, so that's a darker gray, right? You could also try to change this using a color name itself. Where do you find the color names? So what I typically do is, let me open up my browser again, and I just go CSS colors. And then I go pick one randomly. Or, or pick one that you look that, that looks good to you. Uh, you want to pick one that has uh, good support in all the modern browsers, right? So all modern browsers support the following 140 color names. So pick one that you like. Uh, I don't know what that would be. For example, you could try Burley Wood. And if you want Burley Wood, you could just type it in into your code. So uh, we could change this. Say Burley Code, Burley Wood. Yeah, let's run that. Now you have the brown. If you want it to be a purple, blue, violet, you could change that to blue, violet. And you have blue, violet. All right, so it could be any of this or it could just be the color code itself. So let's pick a color. Let's say cadet blue, right? So let's change that and let's say 5F 9E A0. All right, so run that. Okay, now you have the cadet blue. And we also, in th on top of the colors, we also want to change the name. For example, the X itself, We this is the min minimum, right? Um, if you change this to average, See what happened is that it's actually quite smart because it doesn't actually give you this horrible name here. It actually make it more English like so average of seconds per km, right? If you change this to maximum, like max, it's gonna say max of this, this, this. Alright. So let's go back to average. And suppose we want to change this as well. I want to give it a, its own title. Um so what you can do is you can say instead of using the shorthand here, I'm gonna copy of that. And we want to actually use the constructor alternate x because i told you earlier that you could specify other parameters in here so one of those parameters happens to be the axis and the axis would allow you to change the title so for example you could say title equals to and you could then say something like um you know the, the seconds per km and then you say average like this right a cool note here is that if you if that's the only thing for axis, you could even omit that and just put it right in here, close that, and it will still work. If that's the only thing in your axis, you could just omit the axis altogether and just put spe a specified title directly in here within your alternate X itself. Also, you could change the scale of it. For example, you could see off, uh, like right now, you want to change the scale of that. You could add a, maybe make this a logarithmic, uh, logarithmic scale. So how you do that is you add scale and you can say odd scale and you can say type equals to and Instead of a linear scale, I'm gonna change that to log, right? You could do that as well. And then Y, let's also change the name here. So let's also take away this and say alternate Y. And we wanna specify that, oops. And here you can say odd dot axis, which you can also omit if that's the only thing you want here. So you can say title is this, right? But if title is the only thing you put in your axis, you might as well take that out and just put title. It's easier, it's cleaner, but uh, of course, Axis allows you to do a lot of things that we're going to explore as well. So I'm just going to show you this and I'm going to keep it this way um, so you can have more reference. Uh, I'm gonna, you can also continue to work with the interactive. So you, your zoom in will still work. All of this stuff will still work. So yeah, you can swap between linear and log. This is log, linear. Okay, well, let's, let's keep to log. So let's remove the interactive as well. Suppose we take a look at our data again. There's all these different columns. Suppose I want to create another column up at the bottom, um, or actually to the right. I want to have a day of week, for example. I also want to have the week number of this particular run. So for example, I have the date itself, right? I want to say this is week number one of the year, week number two, week number three. So this is the ISO week. So how do I create the new column that specify the week number and um, attach that to the end of the column, right? So we could, we could do something like, let's just go ahead and say week, and we say DF, and we want to take the start time we could say dot dt dot week. And so if you print that out now, okay, so you should see that now this is week number two, this is week number two, this is week number five. And that's, that looks about right. Run that, you see all the way uh, week 26. Okay, that's kind of right because um, this, this data set that I uploaded, that's only up to the end of June. So uh, if, if there are 52 weeks in a year, then that's the 26 weeks in half a year. So that's 26. 
And now let's create a plot to track our running speed over time. So we want to use the number of weeks. We ideally want to see the uh, plot slightly going down because it means you're running faster, you're taking less seconds to complete one km. So ideally you want to see something like that, right? So let's go ahead and see, um, you know, what's the trend of our running, uh, of our athletic performance uh, looking. So let's say odd chart. Okay, again, it takes only one parameter, which is the sort of the, the source of the data. What was the data frame in here? So data frame is called DF, so we want to specify that. And instead of mark point, we've been using mark point all this time, but I want to see a trend of a line. So I'm going to say mark line instead, and I'm going to say uh, dot encode. And then here, I want to say X. The X is actually just going to be the week itself. This is the new column that we just created here, right? This is the column. So we're going to say week, and you could give it a title, and that could just be week number, for example. Then you could have a Y. Now, what would Y be? Now, if you actually look at the speed here, you want to look at the speed. If you don't care about the average, you just have to specify seconds per cam. You could do that. But if you want to look at the average, so you want to look at the average itself. So how, what, what is the average? So let's say there are five runs here in the week of 26. There are five different runs. Each run has a different speed. Three minutes, 58 seconds, three minutes, 54 seconds, three minutes, 50 seconds, and three minutes, 50 eight seconds. So how do you find the average of them? So again, you could use the average that you learned about earlier. So we could take off this say average, and then we specify that in here, um, put everything in the quotation. So you don't need this quotation anymore, just average like this, right? So let's run all of that. And now we have that. And everything that you learn about colorings and stuff, those still works. So we could go ahead and add a, uh, for example, a very manly color. And a very manly color is something like hot pink hot pink and that's a masculine color right and then to augment this plot we might maybe we like to add some circle marks on it we, we want to add actually a point so each one of those average we want to actually add a point to it so how do we do that now one thing you could do is you could create something like this could be the line right and we print out the line so this is still going to work right we just create the, the line which is this plot and then we specify that to line just now we didn't create a variable now we name a variable called line and we just print that out but what we could also do is to take that and we copy all of this and now instead of line we're going to call it circle and we only going to change from line to circle we don't even want the color to be hot pink we want something more masculine um and so that's just gonna be a deep pink so the only color more masculine than a hot pink is a deep pink right and we are still gonna have the same encoding for x and y and now we could just layer that on top by using the plus so now what's happened is that we have the line and then we add circle by just appending that. That's a shorthand. We're going to see it, you know, what it actually means um, in, in later session, sessions. So we're just going to run that. And so now we have the deep pink. They, they come too close to each other. The colors come too close to each other. So you don't really see any difference. If you change this to lavender blush, so we're picking all the great uh, manly colors, putting all of that. This is a little bit too faint now, but I guess light pink would work, right? Hopefully some, oh, that, that's okay. Now you can see the difference. So that's a light pink for the line. That's a deep pink for the circles. But this is rather inefficient because we are specifying two things. And what if we change this and then we forgot to rename it here, right? What if we specify here something and then we change this and we have to now modify both places. So what you want to do ideally is to sort of be able to reuse and modify a previous chart definition. Uh, so we, rather than we completely rewrite a chart, we can just start from the line chart and then build from there. Right. So what I mean by this is I'm going to rename this base uh, line to base. So I'm going to not have line anymore. I'm going to call it base. And then what happened is I could take this, remove all of this now, and I could say take base and build on top of base by adding, by overriding the mark line to mark circle. So that also works. So if I do this, now it's going to take the base and then it's just going to overwrite the mark line, but it's still going to inherit all of the encoding. So everything that is specified there, it still works. So this allows you to greatly reuse what you, uh, you know, what you written instead of having to rewrite the, recompose the whole chart, right? So here we just impo uh, invoking the mark, sort of mark circle or mark point to generate this new chart definition to overwrite that with a different mark type, but inheriting everything else. Okay. And so here you could still have your color um, and you could specify your color. Let's say like salmon now. Uh, like someone looks a little bit too, hmm, I guess magenta then. All right, that's good, that's good enough. I, I do want to mention that uh, when you add points to lines, this workflow is so common. Having to add points onto lines is so common that the line mark actually also includes another shorthand to generate a new layer for you. So what you need to do is to just add the 
point equals to true. So this is the same as, let me just show you, copy of this, create a new one. This is the same as you just going in there and just basically specifying point equals to true. All right, if you run that, it's still the same thing um, because it's so common to have to add a point to the to sort of the line, right? So it just gives you that. Now let's talk a little bit about layouting, right? Because th these are all nice. You can do a lot of this in a lot of other sort of visualization libraries, but what really shows the, the, the full you know feature or sh shows the, f the main highlight of this library is that it's so easy to to layer or, um, you know all these different plots and compose them together in a composition plot and then giving different um, you know sort of like making making them link together so link the plots together so let's learn about layout first all right so if we have two charts and we want to see them next to each other let's go ahead and create two charts so the first one let's go ahead and create something for the speed all right so let's say speed or chart Okay, specify one parameter, that's the data. Data equals to what? We said df. Okay, that's where the data is from. I'm gonna specify a mark line. And you want a color. So I'm not gonna mess too much with this now. I'm just gonna specify a color that uh, I know that uh, it's gonna look okay. And I also want this to have a point equals to true, just to have the point on the colors, on the line. And then we want an encoding. All right. And for the X itself, we just wanna have alternate X. Wanna have that as weak. You could have a title, right? I could give this a title called, called title week number. And then let's see, what about Y? What do we want? So Y, you could say odd Y. Um, let's say we use the average of seconds per km. Very similar to what we've written above. So seconds per km. Let's run that. Okay. So nothing gets printed out because we didn't print it. Let's run speed. Okay, now it's got printed out. Okay, that's cool. So we have the speed. But let's say we want to have another one next to it. And this one, we want to look at, let's say, the distance. Right, so all chart df. We also want to have a mark line, we want to also have an encode, but now we want x to be something else, we want y to be something else. For example, if you want to have like y to be odd.x, let's 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 actually copy the one up here. Let's let's just use speed, okay? And then what about y? What if we want y to be uh, I don't know, sum of distance? So, how many, how much, how many meters do we run? that week okay so for each week we run a certain amount of distance um how many what, what is the total amount of distance we run for each week of them and now we can put them side by side and we use them by using a shorthand here called the pipe operator we pipe them like this so speed is going to appear on the left distance is going to appear on the right so here speed on the left distance on the right let's see what happened if we sort of just inherit and then just overwrite the y so we can just say this equals to speed and then we set encode and we only need to overwrite y, which is this. Move this back up. I guess we could save ourselves some, some of those time there. Run it, still works. So you just inherit from all of this, inherit the mark line color, inherit the alt x, inherit everything except just overwrite the alt y. You could also do that. So this is kind of, uh, this is actually called concatenation. All right. So concatenation operators, they place multiple charts either side by side um, through vertically or horizontally. So the pipe operator, pipe, put them side by side. That's horizontally. And then the end operator puts them vertically. All right. So I could also say this, change this to end sign just to see how it looks like. Now it's put, it puts them, uh, you know, uh, vertically. And of course, the, mat the ordering also matters. If I want to put this on the left, I could. So just put this onto the left and then speed. And now you see that this one goes to the left, that one goes to the right. Okay, so you could use the, this is the ampersand, this is the pipe operator to sort of change the position, whether uh, you want to have them horizontally next to each other or you want to have them vertically next to each other. And as you can see, up to this point, uh, Altair is just very declarative. You just use all of this. And also, by the way, if you want to overlay them, you just have to change this to plus. This is something we've seen earlier. Just, just this is kind of a way for you to overlay one layer on top of another. And um, this is also another sort of uh, shorthand as well. So you do that and now you have the uh, you have the first one up here, and then this is a second layer up here. But because the the, the the scales are different, so one takes on the whole scale, one only you know is between this. So we actually don't want that. Just that's just for demo purposes. I'm gonna change this back up to the pipe operator. 
Now, in addition to basic plotting and view composition, which you've seen here, one of Altair's um, very exciting feature, and actually Vega Lite's uh, exciting feature, is its support for interaction. So earlier, we seen how we could just add the interactive method, just chain them to be like interactive, just like this, add an interactive at the end of it. And now we can make the speed interactive. Um, so we make this interactive, we can zoom in, we can zoom out, look at that, we can zoom in, zoom out. But there are more than you can do than just adding an interactive uh, method to that. For example, you could change how you want the mouse over effect to, uh, you know, what, what, what you want to have when you hover over, around your mouse. So this is the mouse hover effect, okay, the two tip effect. So you could do that. And let's actually go ahead and just maybe copy most of what we did here. Let's copy speed, uh, bring it down. Let's run off that. Let's do speed. Okay, that's there. Let's add interactive first, because that's very easy to do, right? So we can zoom in, zoom out, but there's no two-tip effect. So how do we add a two-tip effect? So again, it's very declarative. You don't tell it how to do it, you say what you want it to be done, so, right? So declarative is this style of coding where you say, um, kind of like ggplot and all these great, fantastic um, declarative, right? So these are, uh, um, you say, tell it what you want, not how you want it. Okay, that's different from a lot of libraries, right? Uh, especially if you use like MATLAB in the past, uh, you know what I mean, or what I mean by that. So you, you say what you want, you, you, don't tell, you don't tell library how you want it, you just say what you want, right? So in this case here, we could say two tip, and let's take a look at all the columns that we have up there, shall we? Say columns, okay, we have all these columns up here, we have the types, what time, okay, let's pick a few. Let's say when we hover over, we wanna see a few things. I definitely wanna see a start time, because that's a date, actually, instead of start time. I think there is a date column that is even cleaner, more human friendly. So I'm gonna say date, and then I wanna have distance. I wanna say how, what is the total distance that I run um, on that day. I wanna say max pace, and you wanna spell this correctly. So you're either just gonna copy that from there, or you just make sure you don't put any uh, typos. And finally, seconds per cam. All right, and that's kind of it. Let's run that, okay? So if we take a look at this, it's a little bit messy because we aggregate them by week, but we could still see the two tip and it is still working, right? It is a little bit messy. We could maybe think about how we want to actually display two tip. We're going to fix that later, but but each point, it did show you a two tip, right? So I could hover over uh, any of this measurement. I could say on this day, on the 14th of June, uh, 7 p.m., 7 or 3 p.m., um, I, I run a total of 1,003 meters and I took about 258.22 seconds to run that one cam, all right? So I could see that. And so there, there is that, all of this stuff are uh, in there. Maybe line isn't a real, the best thing to do. You could use the point, for example, change the point. And now you don't need the point equals to true anymore. Run that, and now this probably, it makes probably more sense than to uh, have a line because some of them are just gonna be, they, they aggregated into the week, right? Um, that, that's kind of it. And if you see me do all of this data cleansing there, for example, extracting the day of week, the week, uh, let me go back to that part of the code here. I say .dt .week, or like I would say something like .dt .day underscore name. Um, so I, I'm actually transforming the data frame instead of uh, instead of doing it within Altair, right? I'm transforming the data frame using pandas. And then from pandas, once I have that, I pass that into Altair. It turns out that that's not the only way. If you want to do some sort of time unit transform, Altair also supports that. So for daytime inputs or variables, they are really, really useful. Let me show you what I mean by that. If I go ahead and create an Altair chart again, let's say DF. This time, we've seen the mark line, we've seen the mark point, we haven't seen mark bar. So let's take a look at mark bar, right? So we're going to say dot encode. And I want to have, X, on the x-axis, I want to have, um, what do I want to have? I, I don't know, let's, let's think about that later. Alternate, auto, uh, Y. I want to try something like, um, I want to show you the time unit transform. So I could do something like, let's say I could do something like months, right? Start time. And then here I could, maybe maybe I just should have just to do a count, right? I could go ahead and just do a count. Speed per cam, all right? So what's happening here is, I'm actually gonna have my Y axis, that's just gonna be each month. Now notice that there is no such a thing as months start time as a column in my data frame. In the data frame, there's a variable called start time. What I'm doing is that I'm using the time unit transform that is provided to me by Altair and using that and calling on it and, and say, okay, just find out, just find out uh, what is the month of each one of them and then count. So this is gonna produce a histogram, produce a number of count for each month. How many runs did I run each month? So let me run all of that. 
Okay, it's gonna say something. It's gonna say that uh, the month start time encoding field is specified without a type. It cannot be inferred because it does not match any column in the data. So this column doesn't exist in the data, so it cannot be inferred. So this is going back to what I said at the beginning of the video. If this is a, a, a column in the data frame, it knows what to infer. It knows it by looking at the D types, by looking at df.d types, it, it know how to infer the right uh, type for it. But here, because this doesn't exist, we need to give it a type. So you could specify something like this is ordinal, right? And months is not spelled correctly. Therefore, you don't have that. Month is correct. So month, now you have month start time, and then you have the number of runs for each one of them. So in January, I run maybe two runs, and then I run eight runs, and then uh, I guess five runs, and then nine runs, and then so on and so forth, and 22 runs in May. So I've been running almost like every day in the month of May, except missing out only like eight or nine days, right? So you could try that. And there are a lot of time transform. Another one you could do, just to show you how or what I mean by that, I could change this to hours, for example. And let me run that. And now it gave me all this different run. I run one in uh, 7 a.m. in the morning, and then uh, four in the afternoon, uh, five uh, uh, in, in the evening, and then eight in late evening, and then nine, and then ten, um, uh, eight, right? So there are the different times, and each one of those times, it gave me, a, again, a histogram of how many runs I've run. Almost 80, 90% of the time, I, I tend to run towards the, you know, the 5 to 7 uh, p.m. band. To look at all this time unit transform, I'm going to click on the link, and I'm going to open up my browser and show you. So these are the time unit transform. You could try any of this, right? There's the date, there's the day. I, I show you the hours, there's the hours, there's the minutes. You could sort of bin them. This is kind of a bin transform. They, you bin them into uh, the year, year, quarter, year, month. So you did not have to open up pandas and then use pandas to sort of do the transformation. If this is just gonna be a one-off plot, you did not need that in your data frame, you just a, a one-off plot. You could just directly use this Altair um, date transformation uh, directly in there. Again, we're going to see a lot of these examples as we build out on this episode and we're going to build out uh, the, the rest of the series. There's going to be a lot of uh, opportunities to actually experiment with some of this. So I'm not going to um, you know, specify, uh, have spent too much time on that. So turn it back off. But I do want to end with something, you know, a little bit more impressive than um, building out simple plots like that. I want to show you one of the one of the favorite uh, feature of, of, of mine uh, when it comes to like using uh, Altair to build up plots and it's the reason why I use that so much and maybe some of you have seen me use that in, in more complex ways when I build up you know all these uh, uh, interactive web apps dashboards and stuff but I want to show you that and I don't expect you to fully understand everything in this demo but I'm going to try my best to explain them um, line by line and, and so you know we probably end with this sort of aspirational example so you have something to take home with and then you could look forward to sort of next uh, uh, lesson in this series all right so let's take let's start from uh, think about how we could build a composition where there are multiple plots and we could do something fancy like maybe um uh, 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 zooming in one area or tapping on something all right so let's go ahead and first create the, the first uh, sort of first plot so i'm going to copy off this i'm going to paste that in here and i want to just call them runs right and i'm going to print out runs right so runs uh, nothing too fancy nothing too different but of course you want a very masculine color um, otherwise what's the point of uh, being uh, you know uh, 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 being athletic running every day and then you don't get to pick a, a, a good a good uh, manly color right so we have that um, I don't want the hours I want the months and let's specify that's always correct and let's um, also I don't need the the thing is that when I actually have this um, keeps me spelling that um, I don't actually need this start time months anymore because it's kind of obvious that these are all referring to months. So I don't need the title. So how do I switch off a title? You could just say title equals to none. So you could say exist and then we didn't exist title equals to none. Or you could just say title equals to none right outside. And that's good enough. So that's good enough. Um, you could also optionally specify a time unit. This is not necessary. But later on, you see me use uh, some of these concepts. So I might as well show you now. But it makes no difference right now. It's still the same thing. So it makes no difference. Uh, I would like to actually have a tool tip. For example, if I hover over a certain, uh, like one of these bar, I want to see something. So this is a concept that you've seen before. Tool tip, specify an array. What do you want to see here? So in your data frame, if the data frame, if it already exists in your data frame, you could just specify the name. You could, for example, say start time because this is just a name within the data, within the data frame itself. But since we're using the month, which doesn't exist, then we want to also wrap this under month. So Again, Altair is going to generate it on the fly without you having to manipulate your data first. But if you keep using it, then I, I recommend you probably want to just go and um, you know, add that into your data frame, right? So we're going to say month and count, and that's kind of good enough. Let's run that. Okay, now we see all of this. January, how many runs do I have? Two runs. February, how many runs? Eight. And then five. And then nine. And 22. And 14. Okay. Um, I also could change the opacity. 
to make it a little bit faint. All right. Um, so this is not the way you do it. The way you do it is you say odd dot val value and you say 0 0.4 like this. Okay, now it's a little bit more faint. But wouldn't it be nice if you change this opacity programmatically? All right, wouldn't it be nice for that? So you could say something like this. You could say create a brush. And this is basically, at a command here. This is basically creating an interval selection over, okay. I want a brush and I want it to be, because this is top down, this is going to be on the y-axis. I want it to be over the y-axis encoding. So all dot selection interval, because this is not a point. If this is a point, if this is a scatter plot like that, then I probably wouldn't say interval. I'll probably say a point, right? A selection single. I would say selections. But here I want to select an uh, interval. I want to say, I want to look at all the runs between February and March or February or April or maybe March to June. I want to see all the runs between that. So it's an interval. And I want to say encodings equals to, and this is just going to be on a y-axis. I don't need it to be on an axis, just on a y-axis. And then with this brush, I could now go ahead and say something like, create a, determine the opacity based on brush. So this is sort of a condition here. So opacity equals to, here you set a condition. So a condition, you have, this is the condition, this is the predicate, and then the true con the, the, the true result and the false result. So see is saying that if it's selected in the brush, then what? Then the value should just be 1. But if not, the value should be 0.2. Then now you could change this opacity to meet that opacity like this, right? So you're creating the opacity conditionally and you specify pass that back into this and let's run off that well you get an error because the brush is created but it's not being used anyway right so let's go ahead and add a selection and we call this brush now brush is being used so we create an interval selection and we add that to this so now we could go ahead and specify and look look at the way we could just this is the interval right it's the interval and we could uh, so sort of drag it drop it uh, maybe January to February, right? We could just say all the runs between this. Now let's go ahead and create a second uh, plot, shall we? Let's, this is the runs. Let's keep runs there, right? Let's keep runs there. But let's create another one. And I want to call, I want to have this plot be speed. And speed is just going to be odd dot chart. Same thing, DF. But now I want it to be marked circle. Okay, circle is different from point. So the difference between circle and point is that if I show you point itself it gives you this um, sort of this this round and it's not filled in right but what if i change the mark point to mark circle it's going to fill the color so it's just not going to give you this round thing it's going to actually fill the color so the marking of that so just kind of a shorthand for that just mark circle so now what happens is that it's now going to be a flat um you know it's going to be filled in instead of earlier it's just a, a round so that's kind of the difference okay so show you that again mark circle change that to mark point see that's the difference right so here I want to actually have marked circle. And again, the, co the color of the circle, I want it to be something um, very manly, plum. And I'm going to change the encoding as well. So what do I want in speed? So in speed, I want to actually have, let's say on the x-axis, I want it to be the number of week, uh, the, the number of weeks. So week 1 to week 26, because this is half a year. All right, this is up to the end of June. So odd x, that's going to be week, and axis, you could say axis and axis uh, title equals something, but you know that you could already just write title and you could say week number. But what about y? Y would just be seconds uh, per km. Okay, and what you need to do now is you could also, um, I guess you could also set the opacity to follow that opacity up there. So you could say opacity equals to opacity. So this is also going to change the way that the points uh, the colors of the points based on whether or not they are being selected all right so this is not going to show unless you put it somewhere so we want to specify that speed runs like this or you can put run speed first before speed so that's one of that okay let's see what happens now if we try to zoom in on this area see now that point on the left that's being selected see that we select this and we could also try this okay that's looking good um i want to actually this is not Perfect because we want to actually change the width and the height a little bit. Um, let's actually change this one here. We want to add the properties. Now the width and the height are specified in pixels. So, so the width, I want it to be something 300. Let's say the height is also 300. Um, like this. You run that. Okay, so height is okay, but this is a bit too thick. 
uh, it still works, it's just a little bit too thick. So let's change this to 240 and let's copy the same thing here um, and paste it in here. And now you have something like this. Maybe you can argue that you could look, make it look better by making it a little bit wider. Um, for example, this one could be 360, I guess. Um, this would be okay, I guess. Yeah, that's fine. You know, it could, it could be better, but here really the, 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 the fundamentals are there. All right. Now, if you take only this one out, okay, just specify, just take out the speed. Just copy off this. We don't need the properties. We just need the speed. Put this in here. Now, what I want to show you here is that uh, as a Python API to Vega Lite, a lot of this stuff here, they're not actually even uh, Altair's uh, own feature. They're actually, Altair is kind of a, a gateway to Vega Lite, which is a, a JavaScript library, right? So Altair's main purpose is actually to convert, convert all this uh, Python written plot specification into a JSON string that Vega Lite could uh, parse and it confirms to the Vega Lite schema. And so Vega Lite is doing a lot of this kind of, uh, a, a lot of this stuff is basically just Vega Lite's own feature. What Altair does is that it tries to find a way to take what you write in Python and output a sort of JSON string that can be read and understood by Vega Lite. And then if Vega Lite could understood that, it could then use it to generate and to create your plots. All right. So how do you actually see what's happening beneath the hood and actually try to uh, inspect that a little bit more. So I could go ahead and just print out speed again, just to show you that this is the same uh, stuff here. We don't have the opacity anymore. So let's take that away. All right, we have this. And what we're gonna do, I'm gonna show you this. I wanna show you when I take the speed and I wanna say print speed to JSON, okay? It's gonna print out all of this. So what happened is that it's gonna use a certain schema. This is a schema, the vega.github.io. And this, I think, goes all the way down to D3. If you heard of a Vega Lite or D3, then this basically goes all the way down to D3 and you use that to pass that. But this is only showing me the first few sort of line. It haven't shown me what I wanna see. So I could basically just sort of um, say, take a, look, uh, take a look at the last 500 rows, or 500 um, uh, length of the characters of the string. So I can see now encoding. And what I want to point out is this thing about encoding. So when you specify the code here, when you have alternate uh, alt x, alt y, alt x is weak. What happens is that this gets translated into something like this, the key value, the encoding, uh, x, fill, weak, title, weak number, type, quantitative. And then alt y seconds per km, it gets translated to this, all right? So all this shorthand syntax includes a way to just directly specify this type of the fill so that you don't have to write all of this, right? And in other words, if you, whenever you find yourself writing something like this, whenever you find yourself writing something like odd.x, and then you say something like, um, where is the x again? Up there. When you see yourself doing something like this, when you copy that, every time you write that, right? Every time you write this, this is actually the same because you can take a look at this one. It is actually the same as you writing something like x equals odd.x. And you could say something like, because here is the fill, fill equals to weak, uh, title equals to weak number, and finally, type equals to quantitative. This is the same, right? All right, so let's add a command to say that this is the same as this, yeah, basically equivalent, right? Uh, just the same way that if I, let me actually, let me actually just, just to make sure that this point is really clear, right? And this is not really important at this point, but later on, as we, as you troubleshoot your code, you know, if something doesn't work and you're troubleshooting your code, um, you, you know, this will come in handy. So for example, I could, if I say another one, alt.x, okay? And I have my, let's say I say something like using an aggregation function, like weak, right? And then this is gonna be ordinal. You need to specify the type encoding because this doesn't belong, this is not within the data frame, so it doesn't know how to infer the type from it. So if I take that and I say print x to JSON, like this, let's take a look at that, it gives you this. Now this is exactly the same if I were to say x equals to, and I said odd x, and I said aggregate equals to count, which is, which is basically copying up here. Okay, fill equals to weak, uh, type equals to ordinal, right? And if I say, take that and print x to JSON, right? You will see, whoops, it would be exactly the same. So aggregate count, fill weak. So they are actually more of the same. You could have, I could have taught you this, but this is so much to type. This is easier. So I, I always use the shorthand then to spell out all the attributes uh, one by one, the parameter, the name uh, parameters like that. So 
but it, it's good to know that because um, knowing that when is a short a shorthand, not a shorthand, and when is it, and and what does it do, you know, under the hood. These are good for troubleshooting later on when you have problems. All right. So these are those are uh, nice nice things to, uh, to to be aware of at least. All right. So let me copy off that again. I'm gonna almost wrap this up now, and we don't have the well, let's let's make sure that speed still looks great. All right. So that's that. And week is there. Week number is there. Now suppose I want to take all of this and I want to save them into a HTML so I could sort of publish them and present them. What could I do? I could take this and I could say dot save and give it a name. I could say speed dot HTML and I could run it. So if I run this, okay, and I look at my folder, it should there should be a new uh, file called speed dot HTML. So speed dot save. This is the name of the file, and this HTML. If I open that up in Visual Studio Code now, let me save this and let me delete this. This is almost done now. Click on the speed HTML. It outputs a nicely formatted compliant HTML file um, so, uh, that, that, that comprises of all of those things. You see all the values are here. All the values it needs to be able to run that a standalone plot. So I could take this and I can say open that into a open that with a uh, browser. And I, I'm going to have my browser open up so that I could click on speed.html and I could say open in a browser. So let me click on that now and it's going to show that uh, th th this comes up and because this is a HTML file you're also free to edit that and maybe add your own uh, maybe header or whatever you you know you can have your let's say heading in here and you could say this is our first Altair visualization right and you can save that you can refresh this page and bam you see the first Altair visualization so this is a HTML file you can edit it any way you want and you can deploy it any way you want just like how you normally would uh, in a in a um, in a uh, with, with a HTML file and you could add interactivity, you could do all of these things, and then you could deploy them. Uh, push them to your GitHub or use one of those static files uh, hosting service and um, have them somewhere deployed. Um, and that marks the completion of the first module, an introduction to Altair and data visualization as a whole in Python. Now, of course, in the following videos, you'll learn a lot about Altair's model of data types, graphical marks, and visual encoding channels. And my hope is to get you to not only become a highly proficient Altair user, but also a more confident, versatile developer in a world dominated by data and analytics. Um, and if you make it all the way to the end, I would appreciate you sharing the video to a friend and letting me know your feedback in the comment section below. And thank you and see you in the next video.